So the first question, um, and this is to you, Dr. Lennox, how did you choose Christianity compared to any other interpretation of God? And would a firsthand experience of the fulfillment of a prophecy from a text other than the New Testament cause you to change your religious views? And if so, how? Is that all? <laughs> Five more clauses. Yes, that's it. Let me say first that I knew the late Anthony Flew. He never ceased to be a skeptic. But he came to believe in God. You see, there's a confusion in this, and we ought to realize this. I'm a skeptic, just as Mark is. We check things out from a distance. Unfortunately, now, people come along and say, I'm a skeptic, which means I'm an atheist. But that's, that doesn't follow. I did discuss with this with Anthony Flew. The interesting thing about him, and I must tell you this is, he came to believe in a kind of deistic God. Why? On the basis of the information content of DNA. And that's why that book is a very interesting read. Now, you've asked the question that in one sense is not relevant to our topic tonight. It's a personal question. So if you allow me a personal answer, I'll give it. Do you want me to answer it? You do? Oh, that's all right then. We all start somewhere. No one starts in a vacuum intellectually. And the first religion in that sense that I came across was Christianity. And that stuck, not because it was where I started, but because of that thing that I told you that I set about in Cambridge, to spend my life opening my faith in God to all kinds of inspection and so on. And, and therefore I've had to choose. I've got friends in all religions. But let me just give you a simple, very direct answer to this question. And it's this, central to my faith is the claim that Jesus was the Son of God. Major evidence for it, the historical fact of the resurrection. I wouldn't sit here for a millisecond claiming to be a Christian if I didn't believe that happened as a fact of history. Now, my many Jewish friends tell me that Jesus died and did not rise. My many Muslim friends tell me that Jesus did not die. I claim he died and rose. Those views are mutually exclusive. How can you decide an answer to them? I only know of one way. Where does the evidence point? Where does the best evidence point? That's the short answer to the question. The secondary answer to the question is possibly more important. We've discussed morality. And Marx made the point, and I reinforce it, that you find essentially the same basic morality in every philosophy and religion or lack of it. The thing that differentiates Christianity is not in its morality. It's in the question that any morality raises, if there is a God. I don't keep those standards that you read out from scripture. I don't even keep my own standards. If there is a holy God, how am I going to relate to him? Now, if you look at religion, as a, as a subject, so to speak. I talk to many people and say, tell me about your religion. And what they say is, it's like the University of New Mexico. By which they mean there's an entrance test or something, some ceremony you go through and you're in. You then are taught by various professors, you're on the way and it goes up and down. But then there's an awful thing that happens in the end called final examinations. <laughs> now the professors might be marvelous people like these two, but they cannot guarantee that you get a degree, isn't that right? Why is that? Because the basic principle is merit. Now the vast majority of people, even professing Christians, think that that's what religion is. You've got some sort of ceremony possibly performed on you as a child. You're taught, you try and keep on the way, and you hope in the end that when the great assessment comes, God will evaluate your life as the good tipping the ill. Now, Christianity at this level does not compete with any other religion. Let me emphasize that. It's not in competition with any of them because it offers me something none of them offer me. And that is a forgiveness that doesn't occur at the end, but at the beginning. And this is a staggering nature of it. It's why I'm a Christian, actually. That Christ said, and we have to ask, is it true or not? But he said, there's a huge problem between me and God. I've made a mess of my life and possibly of other people's lives and the environment. How can I relate to a God who's holy? 
And Christ says, you cannot work it out from yourself. So what I've come to do is to do something on the basis of which you can be accepted. And you can know it. And that is so huge. Many people don't realize it. They think that we slavishly try and earn merit with God in the hope that one day he's accepted us. My final point is that is this. We never treat a fellow human being that way. I met a girl first day in Cambridge. She was only 16, but she was beautiful. And uh, I decided that I'd like to marry her. So I came to her and I got a cookbook. And I showed her this cookbook. And I said, you see these laws here? There are lots of these laws. Now, I'd like you to be my wife. And the condition is this, that you keep these rules for the next 30 or 40 years. <laughs> and keep me, in, and then I'll accept you. Can you imagine what she would have done? And yet millions of people, ladies and gentlemen, think that is the way to be related to God. We would never insult a fellow human being by making our acceptance of them conditional. And God does this magnificent thing. Christ does the work on the cross. Now, whether we understand it or not, it's worth listening to what actually is involved here. And because, not because I'm better than anybody else, precisely the opposite. Because I trusted him many years ago with the weight of that. I know I'm going to be with him. Not because I'm, I'm good, but because he has given me that forgiveness and pardon. And you know, we haven't mentioned it tonight. But guilt, forgiveness, and that kind of thing are huge elements in students' lives today. I'd love to have another hour to talk about them. But that's basically my answer to that question. Thank you, Dr. Arnold.